It has been my prayer over the last several weeks that you have a better understanding, a better appreciation, and you see to a greater extent your need for God's grace. But sometimes, sometimes we struggle to understand it, don't we? We struggle to understand how it works and, and why and, uh, you know, everything that, that goes around it. Why does God see me worthy of a gift like that, right? How do I deserve something like that? Um, but if you find yourself in that boat where you struggle, keep studying, keep praying, keep trusting in, in God's grace and his ability to save. And don't, don't beat yourself up over that either. Because we open up and we read the New Testament, Jesus' closest followers, they struggled with it. They struggled to understand. They, they walked with Jesus. They followed him. They had daily discussions with him. They sat at his feet every day, in and out, at night, all day long sometimes. And they still struggled. What are you talking about, Jesus? What do you mean? They, they acted in ways that they shouldn't act. They said things that they shouldn't have said. They, under, they misunderstood things they should have understood. And I think, I think we can relate with that, can't we? And such was the case with a man by the name Peter. It wasn't too long, I think, after uh, Jesus' baptism and then his temptation that John the Baptist bears witness to Jesus and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God. With John was two of his disciples, one of them, the, uh, the gospel of, of account of John tells us, his name is Andrew. The other one we understand to be John who wrote the gospel account. And they were there with John the Baptist. They heard and they saw John bear witness to Jesus, behold the Lamb of God. And from that moment on, the two of them began to uh, literally follow Jesus. And they spent the rest of the day with Jesus. I would love to have known what was discussed, wouldn't you? <laughs> I wish we had those conversations recorded in Scripture. But John, part, being part of that, we think, for whatever reason, didn't see the, the, it necessary to write it in his account. Oh, I wish, I wish he would have. Wish he would have. But the first person that Andrew goes to tell is his brother Peter. We are Simon. We have found the Messiah. Come with me. Let me show you. Let, come, come meet him. And so Peter comes with Andrew and he meets Jesus. And Jesus sees Simon and he says to him, he confesses him. He says, you are Simon, the son of John. You, or, you shall be called Cephas. Which in Greek is Peter, or, or in English is Peter. And it means rock. John 1, 35 through 42. Sometime after this account, I don't think it's very long afterwards, Luke gives us a more detailed account of when Jesus calls four fishermen, Peter being one of them, Andrew, and James, and John, to come follow him. A great crowd, that, that moment when that happened, a great crowd was following Jesus, listening to him. I don't know what, if Jesus was talking as they were following, but Jesus finds himself by the Sea of Galilee, so close to the shore, and such was the great uh, number of people that they were pushing him closer and closer to the water, and instead of falling into the water, which I, I account tells he probably could have walked in the water, you know, he just wouldn't have worried about it. But he didn't, wasn't giving anything away too quickly. He steps into a boat there on the shore. You know who owned the boat? Happened to be Peter's boat. Happened to be Peter's boat. And he tells Peter, he says, push out just a, 
a little bit. And so he goes out just a little ways from the shore and the text tells us that Jesus sits down and he begins to teach the people. Again, another time I wish Luke would have told us what Jesus taught. But Luke wasn't so interested in what Jesus taught as he was with the conversation that took place with Peter. And so after Jesus teaches and the, the crowd disperses and they go away, Jesus looks at Peter and he says, I want you to go out into the deep and cast your nets. Peter's a, he's a seasoned fisherman. He's been doing this all his life. He knows how to fish. He knows the best fishing spots. He knows when to fish at this point in the sea. He knows when to fish over here. He knows when the fish aren't biting there, but they are biting here. He knows the Sea of Galilee. He's been raised on the Sea of Galilee. He knows how to fish. It's his life. And he tells Jesus, Master, we have toiled all night and took nothing. Jesus, we fish all night and we don't have anything to show for it. The fish aren't biting. Trust me. But reluctantly, Peter finishes his statement with, but at your word, I'll let down the nets. And so he does. He goes out in the deep, he lets down the nets, and Peter catches such a great load of fish that as he's pulling it into the boats, the nets begin to break. That's what Luke says. There's so many fish, the nets begin to break. And we're told that he motions or he signals to his fishing buddies, James and, and John, and they bring their boat over. And as they get all the fish into the boats, you remember what happens? The boats begin to sink. That's a lot of fish. That's a lot of fish. Peter is stunned. He's amazed. He's humbled. By this miracle. And he throws himself at the feet of Jesus. As you can see in, in the background. He throws himself at the feet of Jesus. And he proclaims his own worthiness. And he says, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. He realized something extraordinary had just happened. And Jesus looks at him. And probably I would, I would think as one of the most calming voices ever. And he says, don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. You're going to start catching people, Peter, not fish. And we're told that they come to shore and not only do they leave this enormous catch of fish, but their boat's behind and they follow after Jesus. This is just the beginning of Peter's struggle to begin to develop a spiritual mind. I mean, think about it. For this whole, your whole life, you see things physically. Everything you interact with is, is physical. It's all tangible. And, and then you have, and, I mean, he grew up knowing the, the Torah and the, the Word of God and the law and following and, and, and all the things of that nature. But now you have a man that's very, very different in what he teaches and what he says and how he approaches things. But as Peter struggles, Jesus begins to prepare him for greatness in the kingdom. And what culminates, in my opinion, to be one of the, one of the greatest displays of grace recorded in Scripture. Peter becomes, as we read the gospel accounts, he becomes one of the three of, of what I, we just kind of call the, in the inner circle of, Jesus, of the twelve. And that is they just spend on occasion a little bit more time in some different places with Jesus than what the other, the rest of the 12 do. And in Matthew 14, as the, the apostles as are crossing the, the Sea of Galilee in their boats and, and the, a storm comes, the, the winds blow and it, and it tosses and churns up the sea and the waves are, are beating against the boat even crashing into uh, their fishing boats and they're scared to death but off into the distance they see a figure on the water you know this and they're scared and then some of them, one of them says I think that's Jesus and remember Peter 
Peter says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out on the water. And he does. He says, Peter, come out on the water. And I would have loved to have seen this. I don't know if Peter just like leaps out of the boat and jumps on the water. Or I think what I would have done is sat on the side of the boat and kind of turned and, and put a little weight with one or, you know, a couple toes on the water. And go, okay, this is, it's working. And then the next foot comes out and then slowly stand up as you put your weight on the water. Because, you know, normally on water you do what? Sink. You just don't, you know, walk on water, right? Nobody's seen that happen before. But here's Jesus doing it. And so Peter gets out on the water. And, and I, he's probably going, I'm walking on water. You know, I can't believe this. And he's walking towards Jesus. But then something else captures his attention. The wind and the waves that are crashing on him. He focuses his attention on those instead of on Jesus. And he begins to sink, and he cries out to Jesus, rescue me. Jesus grabs him by the hand and picks him up, and he says, oh, you of little faith. And I'm thinking, what do you mean, little faith? That's like a lot of faith to get out of the boat, right? But he looks at, Jesus, or at Peter and he says, oh, you of little faith, why do you doubt? On another occasion, Jesus is teaching and he tells the 12, he says, you know, it's not what goes in the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth. And Jesus, or excuse me, and Peter says, explain this to us. I don't understand. What do you mean by this? And Jesus replies, are you still without understanding? Do you see the struggle here? Peter's not understanding. Peter, his faith you know, it, it shrinks back sometimes and Jesus is like, little faith, why do you not understand? We can sympathize with that, I think. But it was also Peter, at the end of a, of a lengthy teaching of Jesus in John 6, as Jesus talks and teaches the people, and he tells them some, very, some things that are very difficult to understand and comprehend. And a great amount of people walk away from Jesus and Jesus looks at the 12 and he says, do you want to leave as well? You know, it's Peter that speaks up. It's Peter that speaks up. And he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and we have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. So Peter's struggling, but he's realizing some things. He knows there's something different about Jesus. He knows that Jesus is, 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 there's something very extraordinary about him. It's after the feeding of the 4,000 that Jesus gathers the 12 and he says, who do the people say that I am? What's being said? They say, well, some say Elijah, some say John the Baptist, some say Jeremiah, some say another one of the prophets. And then Jesus says to them, but who do y'all say that I am? Remember what Peter says? You are the Christ. You're the Christ. You're the anointed one. The son of the living God. It was Peter, though, who rebuked Jesus and said, I will die for you. You're not going to die. I will die for you. And remember what Jesus said? Get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. Peter was not thinking the way God thinks. He didn't have on his mind the things of God. It was Peter as, as uh, Jesus uh, takes him uh, and a, a couple others up the mountain. And Jesus is being transfigured. And you know where Peter was? He woke up halfway through it. He fell asleep. Only to see Jesus in all his glory shining brightly. And it's Peter that's not really understand what's going on, begins to kind of jumble, you know, through things. Should I, should I do this or should I, should I do that? You know, kind of awkwardly, I think he's not really sure what to do because of what's going on. But it was Peter, on another occasion, he was concerned. How often should I forgive my brother? If you have your Bibles, open to Luke 22. Luke 22, starting in verse 31. So we see this, this struggle that Peter has from the very beginning of who Jesus is, but how to think about things, 
how to process things, not understanding. Uh, there, there's just been a struggle with Peter. And I don't think it's just Peter. I think Peter's the only one that's really highlighted with this. And so Luke 22, starting in verse 31, Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. And Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you to both prison and to death. You think Peter meant it? I do. I think he meant it. And then Jesus said, I'll tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. I wonder what Peter thought. Deny you? I would never do that. I've given up my life for you, Jesus. He could have said, you remember that great catch at the very beginning, Jesus? I left it. I left my boat. I left my profession. I left everything to follow you. I will never deny you. Then you know what happens in the garden? They all leave him. Even Peter. As Jesus is betrayed, they, they go into the garden. Previous to that, they go in the garden. It's Peter that falls asleep. Peter, wake up, pray with me. Peter falls asleep. Peter, wake up, pray with me. Falls asleep. In the garden where Jesus is betrayed, as this, this group of Roman soldiers come and they come to arrest Jesus, it's Peter that's ready to fight. I'm going to make good on what I said. And he draws his sword and he cuts off the ear of Malchus. Remember that? He's ready to fight. But in the end, as they arrest Jesus and take him away, all of them leave. And they run away. Peter included. Turn back to Luke 22. Start reading in verse 54. It says, Then they seized him, Jesus, and they led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. When they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him. You know, she's like, I think I recognize this guy. And he said, this man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, woman, I, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. And Peter said, man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? You betray, deny your, your mentor, the one that you spent three years with, day in and day out. The one that you left your whole profession for. The one that you have given everything to. You deny. And he's killed. Murdered. Before you have a chance to make things right. Can you imagine the guilt and the shame and the worthlessness that Peter felt? Jesus, his rabbi, his teacher, was about to be executed. And, G and Peter denied knowing him. I don't know him. I don't know him. I don't know him. 
And he wouldn't get a chance to make it right as he saw Jesus being marched away to the cross. But Jesus was about to die so that Peter could be forgiven. Peter didn't understand that. He didn't realize that. Jesus was going to the cross to make things right, even what Peter did. The Sunday morning after his burial, Jesus' burial, Mary Magdalene, Mary the, the mother of James and Salome, they, they grab their spices and they go to the tomb to anoint the body of Jesus. But when they get there, the stones rolled away and the, the angel says to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified, but he's risen. And if you skip down to verse 7, he says, go tell the apostles and Peter. He's one of the apostles. Why do you think the angel said that? Go tell the apostles. Peter's one of them. But he adds, and Peter. There's a reason for that. Grace is already being extended. Already. Later that night, we know Jesus appeared to the twelve, Peter included. And he did it again eight days later. But nowhere in Scripture do we have any record of the conversation that took place. If there was a conversation that took place between him and Peter, maybe Peter was trying to avoid an awkward conversation. Maybe. We do that sometimes, right? And then John 21 and verse 3, Peter is feeling defeated. I'm convinced. He's feeling defeated. He's feeling dismissed. No longer like the rock that Jesus said that you are. And he tells the other 12, I'm going fishing. I know how to fish. I don't know how to follow Jesus. He struggled with it for three years. Even denied him. I don't know how to follow Jesus, but I know how to fish. I'm going to go back to fishing. I'm not good enough for Jesus. I'm not a faithful disciple. I'm going back to what I know. And the rest following. But while they're out fishing in the Sea of Galilee, they look and see someone on the shore. And John says, it's Jesus. And you know what Peter does? We're told we're about 100 yards out from the shore. Peter jumps in the water. He's done that before too. He's jumped in the water before. And he begins to swim back. And the text seems to indicate that he gets back to shore the same time the boats do. It's kind of funny. But he doesn't go talk to Jesus. You know what Peter does? He counts the fish. 153 of them. 153 large fish. I think he's still feeling ashamed. Still think he's feeling unworthy to follow Jesus. But Jesus says, children, do you have any fish? They say no. And he says, while they're still up, before they come in, cast your net on the right side. You know what they do? They catch fish. Just like they did in Luke chapter 5. The disciple whom Jesus loved tells Peter, we think John, Again, he says it's the Lord. Impulsively, Peter jumps in the water and he begins to swim and the boats get there. And again, he doesn't talk to Jesus. He counts the fish. It's not till after breakfast that Jesus approaches Peter and he asks him a question. Simon, doesn't call him Peter, doesn't say rock. He says, Simon, do you love me more than these? I don't think he's asking me, I don't think he's asking, do you love me more than James and John and Andrew? Do you, do you love me more than these other guys do? No, I think he's talking about the fish. Do you love me more than you love fishing? Oh, there's a lot of us need to ask ourselves that too. Do you love me more than these fish? And he says, Lord, you know I love you. Go feed my sheep. 
The interesting thing about that is, when Jesus says that, he says, Peter, do you agape me? Do you love me unconditionally? Do you love me more than anything else? And Peter responds with, Lord, you know I phileo you. He says, you know I love you like a friend. He didn't say unconditionally. And Jesus says it again. Peter, do you love me unconditionally? And Peter says, Lord, you know I love you like a friend. And then he says it a third time. But Jesus changes words. And he says, Peter, do you even love me as a friend? That had to hurt. And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. I love you like a friend. He says, then go feed my sheep. Peter wasn't about to make a serious commitment again. He had done that and didn't follow through on it. He said, Lord, I'll die with you, but he wouldn't. He didn't. Matter of fact, he denied Jesus. Grace is offered to Peter here. Peter is restored. He is forgiven. And Jesus gives him something to do. Go feed my sheep. I love you, Peter, more than anything in the world. You love me more than anything in the world. Let's get busy. Go do what I've called you to do. You're forgiven. Go do what I've called you to do. Leave these fish behind like you did so quickly three years ago. And let's take care of business. Jesus had big, big plans for Peter. He knew Peter would, would, have the, he would give him the keys of the kingdom. And he would open up the door to the kingdom in Acts chapter 2. And then he tells Peter that, Peter, you're going to die for your faith. And he tells Peter what he told him in the very beginning. Follow me. Maybe you feel like Peter, defeated, without purpose, useless, worthless, full of guilt, and full of shame. Maybe you've made a commitment to Jesus only to not keep it. Maybe you struggle to think spiritually and wonder how in the world could God save someone like me? How could I be worthy of grace? How could I receive it without doing anything for it? Amen. The example of Peter tells us. I think Jesus wants to use us just the way he did Peter for his glory. Turn back to our scripture reading. And what Peter says in our scripture reading makes so much more sense once you understand the life of Peter. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 5. Let's start in verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time He may exalt you. Don't exalt yourself. Peter did that a few times. He was humbled by it. And so Peter's advice is, humble yourself under God. Let Him exalt you. Casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. You think Peter's writing from experience? Jesus says, Peter, Satan's asked for you that he may sift you. And before the day's over, you'll deny me three times. Oh, not me. Not me, Jesus. Peter learned the devil is looking. The devil's prowling around and he will devour you in a second. Peter knows that. Resist him. Stand firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of sufferings are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. In the verses 10 and 11, and after you have suffered a little while, listen to this. The God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, 
and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter is speaking from personal experience. Those words are beautiful when you realize the life of Peter and what he endured and what he did and what he shouldn't have done and the way Jesus was gracious to him. Maybe you find yourself with Peter this morning. And Jesus is calling you back. And Jesus himself will restore you and confirm you and strengthen you. This morning, if you're a child of God, and like Peter, maybe you've denied him in your actions, maybe you've denied him in your words, he's standing here ready to offer you grace and mercy and forgiveness. No questions asked. No explanation needed. Just a humble and penitent heart. If you're not yet a child of God, and you are outside of Christ, understand this. There is no grace. There is no hope outside of Jesus. But inside of, great, inside of Him, there's an abundant, never-ending amount of grace to be lavished and poured upon you along with His mercy and His love and forgiveness. And there's nothing but hope in Jesus Christ. And you can become a child of God this morning by repenting of your sins, being buried in Jesus through baptism for the forgiveness of your sins, raised to walk a new life, immersed in Jesus, bathed in His blood, a recipient of grace, perpetually forgiven. And you can live life free of worry and guilt and shame, forgiven in Jesus Christ. And all because of the grace of God. Isn't it beautiful? If there's anything you need this morning, or anything that we can do for you, please come forward while we stand and while we sing.